uh, you know, uh, thank you everyone. Thank you to all the participants uh, who joined us today. And big welcome to all of you. So my name is Suchit Anand, and I'm from the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition. And we are very happy to welcome you all to this RDS uh, inaugural webinar uh, as part of a webinar series uh, from the IGAD community, the Interest Group on Agriculture Data. So we welcome all interested to join the Interest Group on Agriculture Data and join our community. Uh, so please go to our website. If you go to the RDA website and uh, look at the uh, uh, IGAT uh, uh, Interest Group on Agriculture Data, you can join our mail list and you'll be kept updated. So this is the start of this webinar series. And our, uh, we are very happy to have an excellent speaker and topic for the first webinar, uh, which is uh, focused on the global long-term agriculture experiments uh, network metadata platform that will be presented by Richard Ostler. So I want to introduce our speaker for today, Richard Ostler from the Rotherham STEM research. So much of Richard's career has been involved in addressing the challenges of data integration, especially long-term data sets. He started his career as a computational biologist at the UK's Center for Ecology and Hydrology, working on integrating, uh, integrating and mapping biodiversity and geospatial data sets. And in the early 2000s, managed the UK's GBIF node of over 25 million biodiversity records. He then moved on to clinical trials and long-term population data before returning to environmental sciences, where he joined Rothamsted Research in 2017. At Rothamsted, Richard is an advocate for the application of fair data principles and leads the Agri Ecoinformatics Group, tasked with improving the discovery, access, and reuse of agri ecological data sets. In particular, for Rothamsted's famous long-term field experiments. Richard has also led development of the Global Long-Term Agriculture Experiments Portal, launched in October 2019. And uh, we will be hearing more about this work from Richard uh, now. And I want to also remind all participants that you, you are more than welcome to uh, ask your questions through the chat window. And after the webinar, we will uh, be able to, uh, uh, Richard will be able to answer these questions uh, after the webinar. So please be to feel free to send the questions by chat window uh, during the presentation and after the presentations as well. So now I, I want to hand over to Richard for the presentation he'll be giving. Richard. Thank you, Sujit, um, for that very good in introduction. And uh, yeah, I'm delighted to be the, the first presenter for the series. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the Global Long-Term Experiment Agricultural, Met Agricultural Experiments network metadata platform uh, today and give you a bit of insight into the development of the platform, some of the challenges that we've, we've faced along the way and how we're addressing those. But before I do that, I'd like, first of all, to talk about uh, long-term agricultural experiments more generally and why we think they, they're important. So what are long-term agricultural experiments? Well, to give a, a very basic working back working definition, uh, they're generally accepted as um, experiments that run over a period of at least 10 years. So that's a sort of a minimum period and have multiple cropping cycles. And they're really there to test treatment effects um, over an extended period of time. So they're very good at looking at uh, things like the sustainability and resilience of different management practices. And because they run over very long time scales, they're also very good at looking at processes that operate over long decadal timescales, particularly around soils. The experiments are also highly diverse. So the, the five experiments that you can see on the slide at the moment um, are from four continents. Uh, between them, they have 12 different crops. Uh, one of them also has agroforestry. A couple of them have grass lays, and one also has grazing livestock. So they're, they're very diverse systems that are being tested. These five experiments also have very diverse treatment factors. Uh, so the treatment factors being tested here include the farming system, comparisons of farming systems, comparisons of cropping systems, uh, irrigation, tillage, uh, organic versus mineral fertilization, crop protection, and different nitrogen and fertilization rates. And of the five experiments shown here, only one of them, uh, the one at the bottom, which is the IRI long-term continuous rice experiment, that's the only one that's a, a monoculture. All the others are testing various different crops in some form of rotation. 
It's also worth mentioning one of the, or the two times the treatment factor that you'll very rarely see in this sort of experiment. Um, so the first is novel pest control products. Uh, these experiments aren't really used for, for that kind of testing. And variety trials. So uh, breeding type trials are, are very rarely seen in the long-term experiments world. So from the Rotham set experience, we know that long-term experiments, and more specifically the data and the samples that are produced from these experiments, can be repurposed um, to address questions well beyond the experiment's original research question. Uh, so the experiments at Rotham said, for example, have been used to ask questions ranging from nutrient cycling, uh, the evolution of disease resistance, uh, weed species dynamics, and even temporal patterns of radioactive fallout. And that's just looking at individual experiments in, in isolation. But we think, going back to what I said earlier, if, if long-term experiments can look at processes which operate over deca decadal timescales, then perhaps they're well positioned to look at some of the big societal challenges of the 21st century. So in particular, things like climate change, soil health, biodiversity loss, and food security. And so if we can take data from lots of different long-term experiments, perhaps there's an opportunity to address some of these questions uh, about how we feed ourselves uh, sustainably while staying within safe planetary boundaries. And this is one of the main objectives uh, for setting up this this global network in the first place. And we know that there's, there is some evidence that this is a case of taking these experiments and, and combining the data can help answer some of these questions. So again, using Rotham Set as an example, uh, colleagues at Rotham Set evaluated 16 uh, of our long-term experiments to assess the feasibility of achieving the 4 per 1,000 initiative for increasing soil organic carbon. So this is a, an initiative which looks to increase um, soil organic carbon stocks in the top 40 centimetres of soil over a 20-year period as a way of mitigating against climate change. So the study looked at data from 16 of Rotham State's long-term experiments. Uh, the experiments, while they're all from a very similar climate, uh, had very contrasting soil types, uh, contrasting cropping systems, and contrasting management systems. And they found that looking at these different farming systems uh, from these different experiments, there were major limitations to achieving this, this target for increasing soil organic carbon in temperate regions. But it's important, I think, to note that this study was based on experiments from just one research institute. So again, one of the challenges that we, we face is how we would go about scaling research like this out to the global scale. And again, this is, this is one of the objectives for the Global Long-Term Experiments Network. And we know that there's a lot of experiments out there, long-term agricultural experiments out there. So this is a very incomplete map, but what it, I hope it shows you is that long-term agricultural experiments are very well distributed across all continents um, and cover most of the agricultural, the important uh, biomes as well. But when we set up the network, um, so we, we had an original plan to, to do some meta-analyses using data from several experiments to look at sustainability across different cropping systems. But at a very early stage, we found that finding information about these experiments was very difficult, uh, far more difficult than it really should be. So, if you go and do a, a speculative Google search for long-term agricultural experiments, then you'll get a lot of non-open access academic publications, and you'll get a lot of pretty irrelevant hits. So, so Googling information about long-term experiments doesn't really yield a good set of results. There are some uh, other existing networks, um, so in particular, for example, there's the SOMNET network, the Soil Organic Matter network. But as far as we're concerned, it's effectively a dead network. The online data that, that's available for the network is really just a snapshot of a publication from 2001. Um, so it's already very out of date now. And as experiment manager, we have no way of updating the content that's on, on the, the metadata site. 
the site itself is also technologically very outdated as well. Um, so there's no, for example, API access for discovering any of the any of the data. And again, the focus of Somnet is on soils; it's not agriculture. And so many of the experiments um, that we might be interested in aren't covered because they're not purely about the soil. And this is true for for other networks as well in other related domains. So, for example, the long-term ecological research community. Um, again, it's very relevant to us, but the, the scope is slightly different. So a lot of the agricultural experiments are missed from this particular network. And another problem with, um, as far as we're concerned with the, the LTR network is a lot of the sites in this network are observation sites, not experimental or intervention sites. Uh, which is the case for, for long-term agricultural experiments. So a lot of the critical metadata that we might want to capture um, about the experiment, such as the cropping systems, uh, the experiment design, aren't covered by things like uh, the, the LTR networks. But at a, a national and an institutional scale, things are a lot better. Um, so in Germany, for example, you've got the, the Bonares portal, uh, which is very comprehensive. The metadata is curated, um, but it, it is local to the German context. And again, at Rotham said we have our own metadata portal. It's comprehensive, but it's, it's local to our own institute context. So while there are good resources out there, they're, they're quite disjointed. Um, so what we really want to do is try and bring these kinds of networks together and then fill in and provide a, a platform to fill in the gaps for all the other net all the other experiments which don't have any kind of network support. So this is really the idea behind the, the GL10 metadata portal. Uh, so what we we envisage for the envisage for the portal is to be an open and standards based infrastructure that can start to address this this capacity gap, this problem of finding long term agricultural experiments. So it's really there to serve two purposes. It's there to support the discovery of long-term experiments and to facilitate access to the data from these experiments. But we also hope as well that there, there might be a drive to improve the data quality um, and the curation of, of data from these long-term agricultural experiments. So what is the GL10 metadata portal? Well, we see it um, in the first instance as an infrastructure for long-term experiment managers to register and document their experiments. And we do this by providing a rich metadata uh, format uh, which details uh, the experiment history, the purpose of the experiment, its design, the different treatment factors that are used, and can also characterize the environment in terms of its soil and uh, climate, and give a, an indication of the types of data which might be available. And as far as possible, we're trying to do this using existing standards. What the GL10 metadata portal is not is a data grab. So at the moment, we're only asking for, for the metadata for the experiments. Um, the long-term experiment managers re remain in control of the data um, and how that data is accessed. So if it's an infrastructure to allow managers to register and document their experiments, it's also an infrastructure to allow researchers to discover long, those long-term experiments and connect with long-term experiment managers. So we, we're trying to facilitate the engagement between researcher and long-term experiment manager and the exchange of information and data um, and, to, and enable collaborations to really get this data being used more widely. and, and really show the value and impact of these experiments. We also want the portal to be culturally and technologically open. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, it's, this isn't to be seen as a Rockenstead initiative. Um, we have a, the GL10 project was established by an international consortium, um, and we now have an international steering committee uh, with representation from all continents and with a, a good gender balance. And this steering committee is really there to, to guide and oversee the future development of the network. The network itself is free to join. 
Uh, there's no financial cost uh, to joining the network. Uh, the only things that you need to have in place is an experiment which has been running for at least 10 years and a willingness to share data at some level. The platform itself will be made open source. Um, well, I've got November on here, and hopefully that's still going to be the case, uh, but certainly by the end of the year. So, so all the, the, the code that uh, we use to build the platform will be made available. Uh, and so if we're no longer able to sustain it, then we can at least pass it on. And again, the hosting um, for the platform is in the cloud rather than on an, an institute server. We also have a, an open query API uh, for the portal as well. So as well as uh, having the web front end, we can use it as an infrastructure to support other networks as well. Uh, so we can we can use our API to serve data um, and inter, be interoperable with other platforms. So we're really, in terms of being a sustainable platform, we're, we're really trying to learn from the mistakes, in a way, of, of other networks. Um, and so we hope building an open platform will, will foster this sustainable network infrastructure. In terms of funding, we're currently funded by a philanthropic charitable grant, which covers the costs of um, Carolina, our network coordinator, and the ongoing the, the cost of the initial development. Um, the ongoing IT costs for us are actually relatively low now, uh, but we're looking to support this using things like Amazon grants for research and education. But the portal also needs community support. It, it needs people to use it. So we need a critical mass of experiments in there. We need, need a positive reception, which I'm pleased to say so far has been the case. Um, when we launched, we had uh, just over 50 experiments. We're now up to 65, um, with quite a few more in the pipeline. Um, we've also been discussing with a couple of other networks. So there's, there's good interest in using this uh, within the community to use this platform. But it's true that uh, data sharing concerns do exist. Uh, but as a general rule, uh, the people that we've the, the long-term experiment managers we've spoken to are, are very keen to share their data. Um, so yes, there, there are concerns about misrepresentation of data, but that, that they're not as great as I think we were expecting. But there is a, a caveat to this, and that's the concern of the amount of work that's required to mobilize data, and a lack of resources or skills to do this. Uh, so quite often when we've spoken to people. Um, they've got quite long-term sets of data, but they, they haven't been well curated over the long term. So often the data is sometimes maybe on paper, often it's in things like Excel spreadsheets. Um, and the LTE managers lack the resources to publish the data um, and describe the data in a sort of a meaningful way. So this, this is a, a capacity gap that we've started to identify as we've been reaching out to different different long-term experiments. Okay, so we'll get a bit more technical now. Um, so the GL10 metadata domain. So this, this image hopefully gives you an overview of the kinds of metadata uh, that we're looking to capture. So we, we're trying to capture information for an experiment about the cropping system, um, about the design and the treatments, the kind of samples and data that are available, the environment in terms of its uh, climate and soil, uh, where the experiment is and when it was, um, is it ongoing or has it finished? And we're also capturing metadata about the, the access to the data that's been generated from the experiment and, and licensing and contacts for that data. So in a bit more detail, the, the GL10 meta sch data schema that we've developed and drives the, the metadata portal uh, the core of this is the data site schema. So, so data site schema, um, so if you're not aware, is the schema which supports data, de data set DOIs. Uh, this schema gives us a, a ready-made um, template for capturing a lot of the administrative information that we would want to 
we would want to gather for an experiment. So it's things like a description of the experiment, the organizations and the people involved, uh, where the experiment is located, uh, the temporal coverage for the experiment, any associated publications for the experiment, and the data access and licensing. But it doesn't go into the kind of detail that we want to capture for the experiment design um, and the, the site characterization. So to do that, we've extended the schema um, to capture all, all of this additional information on the crops, the cropping system, the design, the characterization, and the measurements. And as far as possible, we've tried to use existing standards to do this. So uh, particular standards that we've used are plant trace ontology and experimental conditions ontology, which are managed by the Plantione project, uh, Agrivoc environment ontology, and the agronomy ontology. But as we've been going through uh, using various test case experiments, we've quite often found that while these ontologies are, are, are generally pretty good in their coverage, that's not always the case. Um, there's quite often been missing terms that we would want to add. So we've been working as far as possible with the ontology maintainers and vocabulary maintainers to try and start filling some of these gaps. And, and generally that's been a pretty good process. I think that there's a couple of people um, involved in that on the call as well. So I'm just going to try a very quick live demo now to, to give you a a feel of the metadata portal. So just bear with me a second. Uh, no, that's not right. Okay, so hopefully you can see. Um, uh, and a, a map showing various points. Uh, so this is the GL10 metadata portal. Um, so we, you can hopefully see that there's a, a fairly basic search feature on here. So if I type in um, tillage, then we can see that we've reduced down to uh, 26 of the 65 experiments. Um, which are using tillage as a, a treatment factor of some kind. Um, I can further filter down to include experiments which are looking at tillage and maize. And then if I click on one of these plots, I can go in and I can see the metadata for that experiment. Um, so as you can see, there's, there's a very basic description here. We've got information about the data access, uh, the data licensing and the data access policy, information on the organization and the contacts. And then we move down to uh, information about the site location. Um, so all of this so far is, is fairly standard uh, metadata, uh, which we can capture using the data site schema. Uh, but as we move down, we move into the more detailed metadata that we're capturing. So we've got information about the soil type. So this is just the FAO um, soil, soil classification. But we can add a, a more detailed descriptive narrative for the soil description. We can also add soil properties, um, measured soil properties. So you can see here we have clay content. Uh, I think that depth might be a little bit off. Um, but we have a value, so clay content is about 23% uh, for this field. And again, we have a similar set of properties for the climate. So we've got uh, information about the air temperature and precipitation. We then move down to the experiment design. So we have uh, a design type, experimental design type. So this is a split plot design experiment. There's, again, a narrative to give a bit more detail about that design. We've got information on the number of plots, uh, the number of replicates, and the number of harvests each year. And then the, the cropping as well. So maize, wheat, and soybeans are the three crops grown in this experiment. And there are, in fact, four different rotations. And you'll note that we treat uh, monocrop as a, a one-phase rotation here. Um, and then as we go down, we've got information on the 
types of experimental factors. So in this case, we have um, tillage process as one of the factors. Um, so we've had three different treatments, uh, multiple plow, no till and chisel plow. And we also have a nitrogen fertilizer treatment as well. Um, so no nitrogen or nitrogen applied at uh, either 90 or 100 kilograms, depending on the crop. And there's also an indication of the kind of data available here. So in this case, there's information on the grain yield trait. Um, what I hope this shows as well is that the, the very ability of the different treatment factors involved. So I'll come on to that a little bit more in a moment. Okay, so what you didn't really see in that demonstration is the, the, semant the actual semantic annotation going on. So in this screenshot, uh, it's a different experiment, um, and you can see, again, the, the design type, uh, the cropping, and the different treatment factors and measurements that are being made. So again, we've got a, an MPK fertilizer exposure in this case, and we've also got alley cropping as a, different, as a treatment factor. But in the background, a lot of this has been annotated uh, using various controlled vocabulary. So we can see that the design type is annotated um, with a term imported from agronomy ontology. Uh, the maize and the cowpeas both map to terms from agrivoc. Um, and again, the same with the, the different treatment factors. So, Everything within this is, is, as far as we can, has been annotated uh, in a semantic way. And this, this means that we can start to collect data across experiments or metadata across experiments in a, a, a much more formal and standard way so we can start to link across them. So designing, capturing information about um, the different treatment factors, so the, the different interventions which have been manipulated within the experiment has, has been one of the biggest challenges, um, I think, in this project. And this is really down to the, the big variability and variation in the different types of treatment which are used. Because within a, a long-term agricultural experiment, pretty end, much anything that you do as a, a piece of standard management could be used as a treatment factor. So, anything to do with tillage, anything to do with the planting, whether it's the seed rates, um, the time of planting, uh, or again with fertilizer or pesticide applications, all of these things can be used as a, as a treatment. So they can all be manipulated in some way. And so trying to capture as much information as we can about these things has been quite a challenge. So we've, we have two different levels for this. Um, so at the top level, we have the, the, the treatment factor, and then below that, we can specify the different um, variants or categories within that treatment factor. So it could be nitrogen fertilizer exposure is the, the treatment factor, and then below that, we have uh, different levels of nitrogen exposure. Um, so 75 kilograms per hectare, 150 kilograms per hectare, and so on. Alternatively, it could be a, a categorical uh, treatment factor, as is the case with tillage. So tillage would be the treatment factor, and below that we have factor categories, which might be uh, conservation tillage, um, no tillage, uh, conventional tillage. And we can capture additional information here about things like the timing, the crops uh, that that particular treatment would, would be applied to, the application method, and the chemical form as well. Okay, so next steps for the network. Um, so we we launched the metadata portal in uh, the start of October, and we're now really trying to reach out to other long-term experiments and other long-term experiment networks to grow this network. Uh, we're continuing to develop the uh, the schema and the portal. Um, so we have an API, uh, but the, which outputs JSON data, but there's a few improvements that we need to do to this. Uh, the key one being is including all the 
uh, concept URI. So at the moment we only have the labels in there. So that's that's quite quite an important uh, tweak we need we need to make fairly soon. Uh, we also want to do things like improve um, the searching. So at the moment it's a very basic free text, but we would like to add more faceted searching on there. So particularly as more experiments are added, this this will become a much more powerful way of navigating through and selecting different experiments. We're also looking at um, DOI minting. Uh, so what, what we would we are thinking of doing is providing DOIs for the metadata descriptions as they're added to the experiment. And I think one nice thing of, of taking this approach is we can use the DOI as a hook uh, for linking the experiment to the research objects which are, are generated from that experiment, whether it's, it's other publications in journals or whether it's data sets or even samples. Um, if they can reference that that DOI, then it gives us a mechanism for for completing the narrative really of an experiment in in terms of its its data and its its research outputs. So we're not currently hosting any data, um, but I think this is becoming more of an open question now: is whether we all, we should be hosting data, uh, or, and if so, how we do, how we go about doing this? Because we know that there are a number of experiments which would like to publish their data but don't really have the resources to do that. And so that leads on again to this issue of capacity development. So we know that there's, there's evidence of a skills and resourcing gap for LTE data curation. And interestingly, this isn't doesn't appear to be a north-south divide. It's a global problem. Um, I was at a conference fairly recently and uh, people in, in the US and people in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa were, were, were having exactly the same problems in understanding how, how they should be curating their data sets. Um, so clearly if there, there is demand for long-term experiment data sets and we've, we've got to fill these gaps for curating data and publishing data. And we recently submitted a, a BBSRC GCRF proposal uh, with Sequoia University in Tanzania to try and develop a, uh, a data science for long-term experiments. So this would be looking at not just uh, data management for long-term experiments, but also the design and the analysis of these experiments. Um, so we're, we're waiting to hear back from that at the moment. So to conclude then, uh, so we, we believe that long-term data and experiments can be repurposed and we can use these experiments to really address some of the big challenges that we're facing today. And this is one of the core objectives of the, the GL10 project as a whole. And combining data and knowledge and resources can add value to, to individual long-term experiments. It can really make the fullest use of them and really deliver impact from them. And the GL10 metadata portal is really there as an infrastructure to facilitate this. Uh, so it's there to support the discovery of long-term experiments, to facilitate access to the experiment data, and, and hopefully drive, start to drive improvements in data quality. So I'd like to thank the, the Brockenstead and IRI team who were originally involved in developing some of the, uh, the schema and the, the portal, um, the steering committee for the, the GL10, uh, a shout out to some of the ontology developers who have also supported us, and also to our funders, funders of Percy, Percy, uh, BBSRC, and the Laws Agricultural Trust. So, thank you. And um, there's uh, links to the, the website and the public API uh, and email and contacts as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for this very informative uh, presentation. And it was really good to see the demo you showed as well uh, you know for me you know because i'm uh, for me as a uh, somebody who doesn't have any knowledge on this area it was really helpful for me to understand uh, when you show the demo as well so thank you very much for your presentation and i want to now give the opportunity to participants of our webinar you know if you have questions please send uh, through the chat window you know your questions through the chat window and uh, richard will be more than happy to answer those questions so if you want to speak as well, you know, if you uh, inform, you know, we can enable microphone for you, but please uh, send through the chat window so we know, uh, you know, which, which of you are interested to ask questions. So in the meanwhile, I have one uh, question for uh, Richard. Richard, because 
you know, uh, I think in a way, you know, having a presentation for this RDS uh, first uh, webinar series is really good because a lot of colleagues who might not be aware of this work will now hopefully uh, be aware of this work. And because we are recording this webinar and we will make sure the recording of this webinar is made available later, you know, uh, we really hope, you know, that will uh, enable some colleagues around the world who might not be aware of this initiative to contact you and your with your contact details uh, provided and that hopefully will uh, provide more uh, more colleagues to join and uh, link with the initiatives that you are doing so i want to ask you on the for example this igat community you know from your perspective how do you think uh, the igat community can uh, can help uh, you know because I, I was especially interested in the capacity development uh, example you uh, said in the last part of your presentation you know is there any things uh, which you think from your perspective that, uh, you know, the IGAR community can uh, can provide uh, this initiative? Uh, yeah, I think the IGAR community has been really helpful, actually. Um, initially, from just a, a networking point of view, uh, it's mm -hmm. got me in touch with, with quite a few uh, good, relevant people in the community, particularly on the semantics side. So the, the Agri, I think in the first instance, the agri-semantics um, activities within IGAT have been very, very helpful to the work that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had quite a lot of support from that community. I think that going forward, the, the capacity development is certainly an area that we're starting to flag up as, as being problematic. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm, one of the, a good example, I, I suppose, is when we've been talking to people quite a couple of times now, we've, we've had people say, we've my colleague has been running this experiment for, for 20 years. Um, mm. They're getting close to retirement now, and they've got all this data. What do we do with it? Mm. Uh, so it's, it, it's just basic questions like that. Um, mm. how, do you, how do you go about, how do we support people to, to first of all, curate those data sets into a, a good shape and then go about publishing them? Um, and how do we train the, the long-term experiment managers uh, and resource that training so that they can really make the most of their data sets. So I think that, that could be an area where, again, the IGAD community through the, the capacity development working group can, can be quite helpful. Thank you, Richard. And I have one, one more question because I, I uh, saw that you, you have uh, submitted this BBSRC uh, proposal. So is that proposal for, uh, for example, are you looking for uh, planning like a, if, if that proposal is successful, are you thinking of like a training programs specifically focused on this, or is it like a face-to-face -face training program or online uh, training program? So how what was the uh, kind of thinking behind it? Yeah, um, so it's, it, the, the thinking behind it is so it is a sort of a trainer trainer program. So what we would be the plan that we submitted with uh, Sequoin was to develop a training course. Um, looking around statistical design of long-term experiments, uh, the analysis of long-term experiment data, and the curation of long-term experiment data. Um, so it, this, the, the project was primarily focused at uh, SADAC countries. Um, so the, uh, yeah, the, the, the plan is to have a, a work king, um, sorry, a, yeah, a, a, a work group. Uh, and a series of tutorials and, and lessons at uh, Sequoin. Um, we would then identify uh, several key people from that who we would then develop as trainers. Um, so they would come up to, to Rockhamstead for, be funded to come to Rockhamstead for a couple of months, I think it is, um, where they'd get more intensive training on, on statistics and data management uh, and experiment design. And then they would be able to go back and, and spread that knowledge so that's 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 the idea behind that proposal, but it, for us, it would also give us a, a good set of training materials that we could hopefully reuse elsewhere. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, so there are some questions coming in. So uh, Benjamin from Namibia is asking, "What if I am interested to join but do not have a long-term experiment yet, or my experiment is not up to ten years?" Okay, that's, that's a good question. Um, so we, we're having a, a little bit of an internal discussion, and I think this is this will be 
discussed with the, the steering committee. So there's there are a group of experiments um, that we've identified that have that may have funding, um, which will take them up to that 10 year period. So it's, it's a question of whether we should include those or not. Uh, in the the metadata portal itself is, is completely free to access. So if, if you want to just go and look on there and try and find experiments that might have useful data for you to use, then and anyone can go and do that. Um, I would say if you've the, probably the best thing to do, uh, Benjamin, is if you email the GL10 uh, coordinator, so Carolina, I can see has, has put the email uh, in there. So if you email Carolina um, with a bit more information about your experiment, then we can discuss that from there. Thank you, Richard. In fact, I, uh, there is a uh, text message from this uh, uh, the GLTN coordinator. Uh, so this, there's an email in that one, gl10 at rothamstead.ac.uk. Is that the one they have to email? Yes, yeah. So, so Benjamin, you should be able to, you know, go to that email and send your details and, uh, you know, you'll get more details from uh, from the uh, initiative as well. So, yeah, sorry, uh, I put that on the slide. No worries. But so Richard, uh, another question I have is, uh, you know, uh, because you mentioned currently this project is funded uh, now, but uh, so you are, you are actively putting, I understand, you know, through this B BBSRC, you are now putting proposals to find more funding for this, uh, to extend this, right? Uh, yeah, so we, we, um, yeah, so we, we have funding for, I think, another year or so for Carolina's post. So we'll be looking to try and extend that so whether we continue uh, to get funding uh, from the current source or whether we, we have to go out elsewhere uh, we are yeah we're, we're actively looking for for continue to look for the for new sources of funding to continue to support the network right okay thank you so uh, colleagues who are in the uh, uh, participants you know please uh, if you have questions you know please uh, send you know if you want to raise your hand or and if you want to ask the questions uh, using your microphone, let us know, so then we can enable uh, microphone access for you. So if you uh, inform us through the chat window, I will be able to know that. And uh, uh, Cristiano, who is also from Epoyo, you know, he'll be able to, who is the host of the webinar, you know, we will be able to uh, give you microphone access uh, for any colleagues who want to ask uh, any specific questions to Richard directly. So Richard, in the meanwhile, can I also ask, you know, from your experience, you know, uh, of this, uh, you know, what was your biggest challenge to get this effort off the ground? Um, find, finding the money in the first case. Yes. Um, yeah, so particularly for the, the metadata portal, I think that it was, it was relatively easy to convince people that we needed to build this. Um, but it was harder to try and find the money to build it. Mm. Uh, so fortunately, we managed to, to get this uh, charitable grant, uh, which has supported the current phase of development. But there's, yeah, we, we've identified uh, new areas that we want to develop within the portal, um, particularly to try and make it more of an infrastructure uh, that other networks can use. Um, so yes, that's how how we continue to fund. Uh, new developments, I think, will be an ongoing challenge. Mm. Uh, as far as the metadata schema goes, so we we, we originally started looking at this um, from by looking at uh, something called MyAPI, uh, the minimum information about uh, plant phenotyping experiments, um, and we quite quickly found that it, it didn't really work how we wanted it to work for long-term experiments, so particularly with um, things like rotations, uh, which aren't, currently aren't, aren't, I don't think, very well covered within things like MyAPI. So we we started to develop the, the schema from that point of view. But we very quickly, when it came to trying to describe the treatment factors that we wanted to gather, uh, that yeah, very quickly became a, a, a quite a difficult thing to describe. Um, so there's, I think there's still problems with the way that we're doing it, but it it works for now. So there's still refinements we want to make. Another challenge as well have been around crop rotations. So the language for 
expressing crop rotations has, hasn't hasn't really been developed until we until we started looking uh, at this project. Um, I see. Okay, I understand. Uh, so and also uh, because you you uh, one of the slides you also mentioned the steering committee, the governance structure of the uh, initiative. So. Yes. Uh, it would be, be, be interesting to know more about this because especially when I when you show the demo, you know, you were showing ex, you know, the, some around more than 20 uh, different nodes around the world. So did you yeah. reach out to all the key people or key organizations in those nodes to invite them to join the steering committee or how did you uh, come up with the, you know, how, how were you able to get all these colleagues to join the steering committee? So we have... Um... So a couple of years ago at Rothamsted, uh, it, we had a conference to celebrate the, the 175th anniversary of the Broadwalk experiment. So we had we had quite a big long-term experiments conference, and I think yes. nearly 200 attendees there. Uh, and sort of the, the, the core interest in the GL10 as a project uh, really developed there. Um, so the, the people who are involved in the steering committee really have come from that initial core group. Uh, so there was, there was a vote that we had earlier this year uh, where people would nominate uh, to go forward onto the committee and then, then, then be voted on. And so the five people uh, that you see there are the, the, the top five nominees from that process. Yes. Uh, so in, in terms of reaching out now, so yeah, we're doing literature searches is, is one way. I think the, the best way that we've found for uh, finding out about these experiments is, has been through conferences. Um, mm -hmm. and talking, presenting at conferences. So it's, it's still very much like that human networking seems to be yes. the most effective way of um, developing the network. Mm. Yes, I think that's really uh, good insight you gave. I think hopefully, you know, I hope, uh, you know, this webinar, because it's recorded and we will make sure it's sent to the wider community. You know, I, you know, if there, if there are colleagues who are working in this uh, long-term experiments who have not uh, came across this initiative, you know, hopefully some of them will uh, will contact you and you know that will help you uh, find more more colleagues who are working in this area as well yeah yeah that would be um, really good so i want to uh, because you know i haven't seen any other questions from the participants so i would like to and we are uh, nearing our one hour time so uh, i want to uh, thank uh, uh, richard for his uh, excellent presentation and i also want to use this opportunity for all colleagues who are new to the agricultural data interest group to join our mail list uh, and you know it's free and open for everyone and these webinars as i mentioned before this is the inaugural webinar but this is the start of a webinar series uh, where we want to bring together cutting edge developments in agriculture data and want to encourage the free flow of ideas so we hope to offer them twice a month uh, scheduled at two different time zones so that participants in all time zones can attend at least one of those two talks and we will make sure all these uh, uh, webinars are recorded and posted as well so those colleagues who couldn't attend can uh, listen to them later uh, at, at their uh, convenience later as well so uh, if you have any uh, we welcome ideas from all colleagues who want to you know any inputs from on how it, on this webinar series you know please uh, uh, inform through the IGAD uh, mail list as well. So your uh, comment, uh, your inputs are very welcome. And I also want to thank uh, some of the key colleagues who worked to make this possible, especially colleagues from FAO, uh, Cristiano uh, Consolani and uh, Karna Wegner uh, from FAO who, who hosted this webinar series for us. And all the chairs of the IGAD uh, I working group, uh, Ima, uh, uh, so we, you know, we all Ima Subretis, uh, Cynthia Parr, and uh, uh, Patricia Burton. Uh, you know, so they are the chairs of the IGAD uh, working group. So they, you know, they are the ones who uh, started this uh, initiative. Uh, you know, this was based from a uh, RDS uh, plenary meeting 14 in Finland last month. You know, that was decided to start this webinar series. So you know, it, we are really happy, and I, I'm very grateful to all participants of today's webinar who have joined us uh, for this first webinar. And I want to also thank Richard uh, for being our first presenter for this webinar series and also, also the organizers uh, of, of the webinar series. So we thank all of you and we look forward to see you in our future webinars. Uh, we will have another 
webinar in December. Uh, the exact date and time as well as the presentation details will be sent uh, through the IGAD uh, main mail list. So, uh, uh, you know, the main mail list, if you want to join the mail list, you know, the details are in the chat window as well. So, Chris Cristiano has sent the link of that uh, IGAD community. So, please, if you are new to IGAD, you know, I will uh, definitely request you to please go through our website and uh, join our mail list because all the communications and all the updates, even the recording of this webinar, we will make sure it's posted through that mail list as well. So, uh, so from uh, I want to again thank all of you for uh, joining today's webinar and we look forward to seeing you in our, one of our future webinars. Thank you all. Bye for now.